personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library podcast, brought to you by Ammo.com. Today, we're going to talk about one of the best and legalist ways to annoy the government, (laughs) and that's asking them about what they do. Yeah, they don't like – I don't know how this ever became law, Um, but it is. It's the Freedom of Information Act, and um, you can literally just – I mean, you can FOIA yourself. People do. Uh, I haven't, partly because I don't want to know what what they know. This is a total ignorance is bliss thing on my part. Also, I just don't, um, you know, I I don't really want to make myself more of a target by doing it. I don't know if that's true or not. I suspect it probably is. Yeah, I'm sure Biden has your face on his Oval Office dartboard. Well, somebody does anyway. (laughs) Um, I'd love to know who who my government assigned handler is. Maybe we could get together and have coffee. Um, September 28th. He just, he just goes by the moniker Mongo. <laughs> Codename Mongo. The, uh, the 28th of September is International Right to Know Day. This was a uh, meeting between freedom of information organizations across 15 countries in 2002 and is a global observance. It has 200 organizational sponsors every year, International Right to Know Day. Uh, tries to make people aware of the fact that they can access government documents. They will be redacted if they have anything too spicy in them, mind you, for national security purposes, of course. Yeah. And to be sure, I can't find out which brand of Greek yogurt Kamala Harris likes to eat. This is It's not a carte blanche access to all the Ministry of Truth secrets, right? Uh, no, it's... it's <laughs> You can find out quite a bit. I mean, journalists use this to break all kinds of stuff. And I think that, you know, you'd be surprised at what they have to tell you and not surprised at what they redact, I think, is basically how that kind of breaks out. I mean, you see some of these FOIA documents and it's just some of them are nothing but black ink, you know, black, Mm. like it's like the opposite of a highlighter. People know what we're we're talking about. I mean, you're not going to find out anything probably very interesting about the Kennedy assassination, for example, that you can't find out from watching uh, Oliver Stone's JFK or reading Libra by Don DeLillo, uh, both of which are awesome. So the Freedom of Information Act turned 50 years old in July of 2016. And, you know, I, it's, again, it's amazing to me that this thing even exists. Uh, I'm not saying like, oh, we're so lucky that we live in a society, blah, 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 because they shouldn't be able to, to hide, in my opinion, uh, much really of anything. I understand that there's, you know, if everybody knew everything, then uh, a lot of people, a lot of good men keeping us safe would die. I know that there's a lot of people rolling their eyes out there about this, but I am very uh, Jack Nicholson and a few good men about these things that like there's guys that uh, we, we, we pay people to do nasty things so that people don't do nasty things to us. And, uh, you know, maybe in the next life, this will not be true, but in this one, it sure is. So FOIA um, was, you know, very controversial at the time, which isn't very surprising uh, as it was passed in 1966. But, you know, it's an interesting uh, statute. So in if the... The thing that predates FOIA, there's a couple things. The first was the 1789 housekeeping statute. The United States Constitution does not have any procedure for sharing information either between federal bodies or with the public. And this uh, 1789 housekeeping statute, this has got to be one of the first laws they ever passed. Um, that's, that's the first Congress, I would think. Um, that authorized the heads of departments to maintain records and to determine how those records would be used. And I think that like that was probably very appropriate for the time because the federal government was like, you know, three offices and, and, and like eight full-time jobs. 
Uh, so more than that, obviously, but you guys get what I'm saying. Like the federal government did so much less back then so much, especially with, with regard to like your day-to-day life, um, that, you know, I can see how that, that something as kind of seemingly anemic as that would be, um, appropriate for that time. And the legislation was basically a housekeeping measure. It was, um, people rely on that who don't like the idea of freedom of the freedom of information act and a uh, one line amendment was passed in 1959 specifically stating this section does not authorize withholding information from the public or limiting the availability of records to the public um Again, kind of like back on that topic, I think it's important to remember that like even Julian Assange will redact things and what he releases is very uh, considered in terms of like, you know, there's guys in the field who are doing who are like keeping you from getting blown up somewhere. And um, Mm -hmm. and even he's like sensitive to this. So I know there's kind of I know there's there's more than one guy out there listening to this who thinks that like I'm a total cuck about the uh the the the, you know right or however you want to put it of the government to keep certain things secret but i think that like i'm very pragmatic about these things and um you know there's just things that like for the for you to live live your life in a in a uh unmolested manner um not everyone can know everything so sorry if you were expecting me to say something other than that (laughs) No, I get it. I mean, we don't want to burn agents in the fields. It's fun to fall into the line of thinking that we're all Smurfs, but yeah, the people well, out here want to do us. The host that predated you, kind of like I still hate the CIA, but maybe I maybe I like I don't know that I hate them less, but I think that the the the, the, the twenty first the world the the highly interconnected world of the 21st century re- requires some kind of like intelligence gathering about people who mean to do you harm. Uh, and it's, yeah, you know, then they would mean to do you harm even if, uh, well, they wouldn't, if there were no bases in Saudi Arabia, maybe, but like, cause that was the thing that kicked off Al Qaeda was that we had bases in the Holy land, but like, I don't know, the world's full of like evil, nasty people. It reminds people. me of your thoughts on a civil war, how as evil as the government might be, if we destroy it, suddenly evil foreign governments will will be here. So it, it really is, uh, you know, it's a lesser of two evil type of situation to think. These bureaucracies shouldn't be targeting American citizens. That's uh, that's pretty agents. much exactly how I feel about it. Is like they should have they should have no ability to monitor what American citizens are doing without like a yeah. heavy dollop of due of due process, where like they they really have to show this specific guy is going to do this specific thing and we need to monitor him, you know, Mm -hmm. but other than that, they should have no, they shouldn't be able to read your, you know, Gmail account or whatever, which we all know they do. The administrative procedure act is the next step on the line. And, you know, this is, um, the administrative state as we know it today really is created under, FDR, which I uh, would encourage everybody to boo and hiss at home every time I mention his name. So FDR wanted to establish some more housekeeping rules through the Administrative Procedure Act. Uh, so it is his act, but it was passed or enacted anyway after his death. And federal agencies now have to maintain, uh, under this law, have to maintain records and make them available for public inspection. Uh, except for information held confidential for good cause. That is a loophole that you could drive a triple-decker Mack truck through and relies quite heavily on on a great deal of good faith given to the intelligence community, which, by the way, they Mm -hmm. completely had in 1946. Um, The real game-changer in terms of how people view the government and how people uh, are skeptical of government Activity is, you know, the Kennedy assassination, uh, the Vietnam War, and the Pentagon Papers and Watergate. That's kind of what changes public opinion about, you know, the go- I mean, people people really at this time just believe, well, the government would never do anything bad to us. And that was the prevailing attitude. And uh, I know that it seems 
incredibly foolish to people today, but that was the prevailing attitude uh, of people uh, pretty much on every point on the political spectrum during that era. So I think that that's important to remember as we talk about this. Uh, again, tons of loopholes and had tons of ways that you could conceal information, but it did establish offices where the public could uh, get the information and make submittals or requests. They could also publish formal and informal procedures. They also had to publish informal and formal procedures for sharing that information with the public. And uh, they had to make available instructions as to the scope and contents of all papers, reports, and examinations. I'm looking at this and I'm reading it and I'm thinking mostly what you're going to get is a summary that doesn't tell you very much. But people were probably very satisfied with that at the time um, if they were, you know, looking for information. Um, so, yeah, um, FOIA was, you know, kind of this reaction to the cloak and dagger of the Cold War. The government was increasingly secret and uh, journalists who, you know, actually existed at this time uh, were not, you know, people did actual journalism in the 60s and 70s. It wasn't just uh, state propaganda. And I think that's another thing to remember that comes that that we don't have anymore um, that they had back then. And also people just in the public wanted to know more. You know, everybody knows the guy who wants to talk about Operation This and Operation That. Um, and those guys were kind of seeing their genesis during this time period. Uh, Harold Cross in 1953 published The People's Right to Know, and there were congressional initiatives which were led by Democratic Representative John Moss of California, President LBJ, who's another villain that I would urge you to boo and hiss every time you hear his name. He issued a signing statement. These signing statements did not uh, originate under Obama. They just kind of exploded. I think it was actually Bush that they exploded under. But, um, you know, he really wanted to he liked the Freedom of Information Act, which is kind of weird, but uh, you think of, of all the people that he would not be the, the one who wanted anyone poking around, but he was also probably relying upon the mood, which still had a lot of currency that, you know, it was um, the government wouldn't, you know, the government represents us. The government is using its powers to protect us. Um, and they would never do anything like read all of read every single email you've ever sent um as we know that they do now and we don't know and, and i think it's like probably not a bad time to say we don't know that because of the freedom of information act by the way so you know the degree to which this kind of sheds light on anything is i think debatable again these documents often are heavily heavily redacted i think that the bottom line that we need to remember is that if the government doesn't want us to know something they're not going to tell us about it we may find out because of people like edward snowden or julian assange or glenn greenwald but you know we're not like they're not just going to tell us if they don't want us to know so his signing statement said, a democracy works best when the people have all the information that the security of the nation will provide and focused heavily on the fact that the welfare of the nation or the rights of individuals may require that some documents not be made available. Um, I pretty much agree with the words that he wrote, uh, but I, you know, I don't basically take anything that these people say at face value or consider it a statement made in good faith. So I think that that's... Mm -hmm. An, an important uh, thing to kind of put the asterisks on this. Uh, again, I'm 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 a pragmatist, not a Pollyanna. So um, he it was a reluctant concession that the act was necessary. I suspect that they passed it because they didn't really have um, a heck of a lot of choice with regard to public opinion, etc. And he, you know, he did what he could to kind of defang it, which not all that surprising and. But still, we had a law that was written just so that you could get access to the federal uh, government's records. And I think that that is, a, you know, that's a that's a big deal, even if we think that the thing is not worth the paper that it's printed on, because people get really, you know, what makes people more angry than anything in the world? Being disappointed. 
And setting people up for disappointment is a really good way to radicalize them. And I suspect that FOIA being kind of uh, kind of semi-useless is part of what fueled people's discontent with the federal government, people's distrust of intelligence services, things like this. Um, you know, so the FOIA, FOIA was strengthened in the wake of Watergate and the Nixon administration because um, all of a sudden things that people had been doing forever were now bad because Richard Nixon had done them. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone briefly that uh, Bobby Kennedy, the great saint of the liberal Democrats and pretty much everybody's grandmother in New England, you know, audited Richard Nixon's mother for no reason other than to stick it to him. So this notion that, uh, and his mother was old and, you know, infirm and like, this notion that Richard Nixon is 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 the poster child for government chicanery is just the most foolish thing in the world. They just went after him because mostly because he uh, went to Whittier College and Duke instead of Harvard and Yale, and uh, his father ran a grocery stand and things like this, and he wasn't one of the boys. That is my story, and I am sticking to it. One so, of those Quakers who secretly controls the world. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah, they didn't like that he was a Quaker. They didn't let you know he didn't really help himself much by being kind of awkward socially. And um, no, no, the photo of him wearing his Oxford shoes on the beach—that's the one they always <laughs> press into your face to show how unsuave he was. He was a very un. He was a very, very, admittedly a very, very unsuave man. But uh, the thing I always like to remind people about Nixon is that. Among salt of the earth, blue collar Americans, he was insanely popular. I mean, they loved this man, the Archie Bunkers of the world. He was like, it was it's similar to Donald Trump. It's like, he's one of us. Well, no, he's not. <laughs> he was a senator and he was vice president of the United States. He is not a regular guy any more than a billionaire uh, real estate developer is. But people saw him that way. People had a, this affinity with him, and his enemies were mostly, you know, among uh, liberal elites within the Republican Party and um, fellow travelers of communism within the Democratic Party and j- journalists. But the average guy on the street thought, you know, Richard Nixon was the cat's pajamas. Uh, I mean, he, he look at look at the look at the electoral map from 1972. Uh, you know, McGovern. Uh, wanting to legalize acid or whatever was definitely doing some of the lifting on that. But a big part of it was that people just really liked Richard Nixon. So he, you know, the, the, the Nixon administration was seen as being very corrupt. Um, I, I, I would, um, I would take exception to the notion that the, the Nixon in, administration was particularly corrupt. I would say it was probably significantly less corrupt than the Democratic administrations that preceded it, though probably more corrupt than uh, the Carter administration. But Carter was such a Boy Scout that that's not really that surprising. Uh, Carter was just mm-hmm. kind of too stupid to knew what, know what he could – stupid and naive to know what he could have done. So people I, wanted- I like this plan for a peanut-based economy. Yeah, right. So he they want everybody wanted to strengthen FOIA after um after the Nixon administration because Nixon, you know, is is lurking in your closet listening to your every conversation and he has this enemies list as like as if the rest of them didn't. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Good point. No, Nixon no, Nixon was the first guy to do it and they caught him on and they and they and they nipped it right in the bud by nailing Nixon. I think not. They, they, you know, things came out through the media because of the kind of anemic version of FOIA that existed at the time. The FBI, the CIA, the IRS, everybody's favorite alphabet boys. We all learned about what they were doing, and people, the distrust of the government uh, increased significantly during this period. Congress then passed the FOIA amendments of 1974. Uh, they overrode a presidential veto from then President Chevy Chase. I mean Gerald Ford, and <laughs> the uh, the amendments became law. Uh, is any anyone under the age of forty going to get that joke? Probably not. And hey, you know what? That was karma. That's how Chevy Chase got addicted to painkillers in the first place. 
mocking Is that true? Mr. Whip Inflation now. Yeah, he was doing one of those those pratfall gags and he hurt his back so badly he went on morphine. And uh you know, if he seemed a little groggy during National Lampoon Christmas Vacation, it was because he was ridiculing Gerald Ford. That's a career hazard most of us don't have to uh, anticipate. But by all accounts, was still a giant dick before he was addicted to drugs. And honestly, that's the thing I love about Chevy Chase. So the FOIA <laughs> amendments, um, basically, they they gave them ex- they gave them guidelines and response times for information requests, which they did not have before. They could just kind of sandbag you with administrative. Oh yeah, yeah you know, we're getting around to it, and. We'll get your stuff eventually. Um, the lady who has that is out this week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that kind of that kind of thing. They had to actually. I think they had to. This is the first time they had to actually provide the person with a reason for denial, uh, which I'm sure is like I haven't seen any of these, but I'm sure it's like national security. Um, yeah, good cause. You're right. Exactly. There was accountability for denials. I want. I really want to. I really want to know what accountability means because <laughs> accountability and government bureaucrat are not two concepts that exist side by side together. Uh, there was also a, uh, an administrative and legal fee guidance included in this, which was. Um, I think that was another way they used to sandbag people was like, cool, you owe us $50,000 for this 10 page document, (laughs) you know, send the check and we'll send the document. The government and the sunshine act of 1976. God, I hate how they name these things. And they're even worse now that they all have to be acronyms for something. Some poor intern is getting paid. Like, well, that, that was like the fruitiest year of the fruitiest decade too. That is a, uh, that's a good point. Um, what's the name of that movie? Spirit of 76 uh, is one of these movies that only I have seen, but uh, it's got the guys from the punk band Red Cross and David Cassidy goes back in time 200 years to save the Constitution. And anyway, um, yeah, you can kind of see that like weird mid 70s aesthetic on display there. I think 76 also the year that Days and Confused takes place, but we digress. They. <laughs> Wanted to kind of shed some light on how this decision making was happening. I mean, I think that like the cynicism that will permeate this entire episode of this podcast is that um, the government gets to decide, you know, what what constitutes transparency. And if you think for one second that they're providing you with any more transparency than you can wrangle from their white knuckled fingers. Um, I, you're probably not listening to this podcast in the first place, you know? No, no, no. I don't think Agent Doe and Cardholder are letting their secrets go that easily. No. So any meeting involving a quorum of board members or commission members has to be placed on the federal register seven days in advance to allow interested members of the public to attend. Uh, there's again, like there's exemptions to this and they're primarily targeted at journalists in the media because, you know, uh, I mean, I don't know why, well, we don't need these kinds of regulations anymore because we don't have journalists. And it's like three journalists left in the world. Now, uh, Glenn Greenwald, Mike Tracy, and like uh, maybe Julian Assange, you could call a journalist. I, I don't know that that's the best way to categorize him, but sure. He's the third. Yeah. That's sounds more distinguished than leaker. <laughs> Sounds more distinguished than propagandist as well. Mm. The National Defense and Executive Order 12356 by the 80s executive orders concerning the classification and handling of sensitive intelligence information uh, were, you know, par for the course. Truman, Eisenhower, Nixon, Carter, they all had issued their own executive orders. Ronald Reagan's was effective August 1st. 1982 and that gave the classifying authorities tons of room to be able to conceal information from the public on the basis of national security which you know always is that you could anything can be that anything they want to be national security will be i get that there is an actual thing called national security but it's also this kind of 
you know, sp- spook term as uh, Sterner would call it that like doesn't really <laughs> means what they want it to mean. And I think that that is, you know, the operational definition, if not the literal definition so if there is reasonable doubt about the need to classify information, it shall be safeguarded as if it were classified. If there is reasonable doubt as to the appropriate level of classification, it shall be safeguarded at the higher level of classification. Information may be classified or reclassified after an agency has received a quest for it. So, you know, <laughs> it's classified now, much. buddy. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Upon receiving your request for this information, it's now classified. Yeah. Ask us anything you'd like to know. Oh, sorry. We can't tell you. Right. This is this is a uh, CYA for them on things they forgot to classify that they now decide they want to because somebody wants to know about it. The War on Drugs and the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986. Uh, we all love the war on drugs around here. We're all big, big drug warriors. And um, so that, you know, was as, as we all know, and as we've talked about in the past, that was a big expansion of the notion uh, of, or, or of the a big expansion of the police state in America um, in the sense of, you know, intelligence apparatus, giving local police a lot more leeway than they used to have before. And the Reagan administration also amended FOIA, subtitle N, broadened exemptions, uh, particularly with regard to law enforcement, particularly with regard to informants, which I think would be appropriate were we not talking about the war on drugs? You know, we were talking. Well, anyway, um, I think that I think that they have a duty to protect their snitches. We may not like their snitches, but I think that they're kind of ethically bound to make sure that everyone doesn't know who they are, so they don't get their throat cut by uh, drug kingpins. So I, but again, the asterisk on all of this is this is all this ex post facto justification for them wanting to conceal information from you. And I think that we can view both of those things as true at the same time. You know, I think that we can, I I don't think that we have to kind of say that there's no duty to protect their, their confidential informants um, because they're going to use that to lie to us. I think that we, you know, the, one of these quotes that everybody throws out, but I think is very, very true. The price of Liberty is eternal vigilance. And I think that this is a really good example of how the price of Liberty is eternal vigilance, because you know, if you want, uh, you want the, if you want the government to do anything, and I know that there's many of you out there who don't, and I respectfully disagree with you, but if you want the government to do anything, then they have to be able to protect their the people informing on the people that you want them on the bad guys that you want them getting and there needs to be some ability on their part to protect those people and then the other side of that coin is they're going to use that to conceal absolutely everything that they can from you so you need to be so you, even if you accept the first which i do you need to you need to also accept the second which is that you have to constantly be holding their feet to the fire and you know, keeping an eye on what they're doing because that's how you that's how you tighten the loophole. That's how you tighten that triple decker truck size loophole is by keeping an eye on them. And it's a, you know a, a Republican form of government is not for the lazy. And this is why um, I think most of our readers are uh, opposed to democracy in its purest form. And this is I think a good reason why is that. Uh, government uh, by every Yahoo who can crawl across the line on their 18th birthday is not a is not a government of people being eternally vigilant. No, I mean, what was that quote? If you want to know why democracy doesn't work, talk to people. Yes, uh, or the the you know George Carlin classic. Uh, think about how stupid the average person is, and then um, half of people are dumber than that. Right. Half yeah. people in the world are dumber than that. I actually think people have tons of common sense. I just think that, you know, they're, they're, they're not concerned with bigger issues like this and, and maybe they should be, but you know, maybe I should have, uh, wings and a, and a, you know, a 68 Dodge challenger made out of solid gold, but it's not happening in this world. The Clinton administration, if you, you know, I'm going to pause for everybody to boo and hiss. <laughs> they had i'm seeing a theme here yeah i just you know i i hate democrats like i just don't you know <laughs> it's not really any 
Uh, it's, I'm not really, not really shy about it. Uh, I think that uh, I'm sure the Democrat listeners are are shocked that the host of of the Himmel dot com podcast has this opinion. Yeah, all all none of them. Um, I think the only Democratic president that I admire in any way whatsoever that I can immediately call to mind is is Andrew Jackson. So if you go back 150 years, I like one of them. Oh, Martin Van, no, Martin Van Buren's kind of questionable. Um, but in any event, yeah, I mean, I'm not like a, I'm not a giant fan of, well, I, yeah, I don't like George Bush. I'm not a giant fan of Ronald Reagan, though I think that he's somewhat unfairly maligned by people who are kind of in mm. my, you know, Nixon, Trump, Roosevelt, Jackson uh, lineage of American conservatism. Um, I think that he's way overloved by the Bush wing of the Republican Party. But I think that, you know, he he did a lot of things that were very good. I think he got hosed by the cursed Bush crime family on a lot of things. I think he dealt with them in good faith when he shouldn't have. But, you know, like compare them to Clinton uh, and Clinton and LBJ and FDR. And I think that a a very sharp picture emerges of, you know, why uh, why you should loathe the Democratic Party. The FOIA process, uh, they attempted to simplify it, and this was through executive order because there's no way they would have got this passed in 1995 through the, that Republican Congress. Uh, they set forth criteria that would have allowed hundreds of thousands of documents that were more than 25 years old and of permanent historical value to be dis- declassified. Uh, if there is significant doubt about the need to, declass- to need to classify information, it shall not be classified now i think it's again it's worth you know what they say what they mean and why they do it are going to have three different answers and i think that the clinton administration was not a administration that had much interest in protecting the lives of american citizens from hostile foreign state and non-state actors and you know my gut on this is is that this was um kind of lazy virtue signaling on their part you know there's i mean 25 years is not actually that long there's definitely people who probably were up to stuff in the uh, 70s that they wouldn't have wanted to get out that saved your bacon maybe once or twice and um you know again i i i I think that it's uh i think that that government transparency is good but i think that even things that are good can be weaponized in ways that are bad, I think is the way to say what I want to say about that. So 1996, the internet is more is like, you know, more of a thing that people have access to. Um, and they wanted to bring the federal agencies up to scratch with regard to transparency and accessibility. So they wanted to make it so that you could get this information through web pages, reading rooms online, they doubled the agency's response time from 10 days to 20, and they wanted to just make things more accessible. And I don't really have any way to poop in this ice cream. Uh, this sounds, you know, all well and good. After 9-11, of course, we know that things changed dramatically. So, you know, everything was national security. You can read our 9-11 article like if you were born after, you know, whatever, 1995, you have no idea how much everything changed after 9-11. It really did. Uh, whether you agree with the premises of the global war on terror or not, I kind of have uh, feelings about that that are not boiled down into a soundbite and do not need going into right here. And you used to be able to bring a sandwich on a plane. That's a good way of putting it. So... They changed everything. They reversed a lot of stuff to make information less transparent. This is not probably a big shock to anybody. The they they thought that it was. I mean, the the, the narrative was that there's tons of information and tons of people on the internet, and uh, it was way too easy to get information, uh, and you know our enemies could get it and whatever. They already could have redacted anything they wanted, but. I suppose they just wanted to make it a little easier. So they, through you know ex- a combination of executive order and uh, legislative action by the Congress, 
They restricted access to presidential records. The archivist's role was reduced. The American Library Association denounced it. The uh, executive order claimed and stated that the president's constitutional privileges subsume privileges for records reflecting military, diplomatic, or national security secrets, communications of the president or his advisors, legal advice or legal work, and the deliberative process of the president or his advisors. And, you know, there were 50 executive orders issued by George W. Bush. I will pause for a boo hiss right there. Uh, that was in 2001 alone. If you know, o- only only real 2001 kids remember when people were like thought George Bush was this smart, fearless leader for about 15 minutes after 9/11. Mm-hmm. Congress passed the Intelligence Authorization Act for the fiscal year 2003, adding a section entitled "Prohibition on Compliance with Requests for Information Submitted by Foreign Governments to Block Foreign Access." to intelligence community agency records. Um, I don't know. That seems fine, but stupid. Like they can't, like they don't have ways of getting it otherwise, but you know, I'm totally fine with there being two, two sets of rules for Americans and uh, everyone else. So in 2003, president Bush issued executive order one, three, two, nine, two, which amended further president Clinton's earlier executive order one, two, nine, five, eight. That was with regard to classified national security information and bush's order reverted to the precedent that you needed to classify when in doubt and made declassification more difficult uh, and a very low priority for the government Uh, 2007 is the open government act of 2007 which was signed into law again by george w bush of the cursed bush crime family the first sentence identified it as an act to promote accessibility, accountability, and openness in government by strengthening Section 552 of Title V, United States Code, commonly referred to as the Freedom of Information Act. It acknowledged that disclosure, not secrecy, is the dominant objective and that in practice, the Freedom of Information Act has not always lived up to the ideals of that act. In other shocking news, water is wet and the sky is blue. And um, I, you know, and Epstein didn't kill himself, but I'm tired of that meme. So let's just forget that I said that. Uh, The act protected the fee status for news media by defining representatives of the news media and journalists. I that's probably my least favorite provision of it. I certainly don't think they should have any kind of special access that the rest of us do not have, especially now. I mean, they're just you know so i I, i'm on twitter (laughs) at sam jacob 1776 and every single day that i go on to kind of post stories that i'm interested in or plug stuff on ammo.com um i see a thing on the sidebar that's you know people are seeing things with their own eyes here's why the experts say they're wrong and (laughs) this is kind of where we're at with journalists and experts and no way nobody should trust experts they're just hacks well yeah it, it's it's this insane line of thinking that you need some kind of qualification or credential to to report the news it, it, it is so odd how they had to they're pushing to create this this separate journalist class well they don't they don't see how how dangerous it is to monopolize journalism liberals love credentials i mean they lo- they're mm. like they just like credentials you know they just think that because you studied something for four years college or 10 years in college or or whatever that like that you know that makes you it makes you an expert on jumping through hoops anyway it you may have become an expert in your topic as a as a accident uh, yeah. or through a lot of your own personal initiative and gumption but you certainly aren't an expert because you hold credentials but liberals love to tote out credentials to like you know say that people are uh experts in something the Responsibility for attorney fees and litigation costs uh, an agency incurs from FOIA judgments against it. Uh, they, they now bear that burden. Prohibited uh, agencies are now prohibited from assessing certain fees if they fail to comply with FOIA deadlines. I kind of like most of this, honestly, that I'm reading so far. Establish disciplinary actions for arbitrary and complete capricious rejections of requests and instituted a special counsel to submit an annual report to Congress. 
which you know is great uh i'm sure they're reading it yeah fox is watching the hen house on that one guys <laughs> amended response time frames to allow for clarification of requests and a 10-day initial grace period for receipt of the request directed agencies to establish individualized tracking systems for requests a lot of these are just kind of you know most of these i don't think are probably very meaningful in practice even if they're there executive order 13498 by president barack obama boo hiss is you know it was his first executive order it overturned that executive order 13233 which was the uh one that overturned the clinton era one um this may have been the only campaign promise that he ever fulfilled by making the government a smidge more transparent uh i believe he also promised to get a dog (laughs) you're right he did promise to get a dog um i did not vote for barack obama um i voted and nor did i vote for john mccain i did vote in that election i will not tell you for whom i voted but i feel absolutely vindicated by the eight years of the obama administration by refusing to vote for that man who i have pretty much long considered a complete charlatan sleazeball midwit um elevated to his level of incompetence to the nth degree much like the man who preceded him for that matter and the man who preceded him executive privileges were limited to living presidents not their heirs or designees uh it discarded the provision for vice presidential executive privilege. Gosh, I wonder why George Bush did that. <laughs> I wonder why George Bush invented vice presidential executive privilege. Can only imagine. The biggest thing was that it it, it reinstituted the role of the archivist of the United States as the arbiter of disclosure versus executive privilege. Uh, I that sounds stupid to me. Because this person is just some who cares, who cares, unelected, like we should not be giving the archivist. I mean, somebody again, tell me I'm wrong at Sam Jacobs, 1776 on Twitter. Somebody wrote a whole article about how I was wrong and we may be having him. I'm trying to get him on the podcast because it was like it was good. So by all means, I am wrong 60 to 100 times every day. If you want to point it out, by all means, do that. Do it through that method. And you can tweet me too at the real Glenn Co- Close. <laughs> Send me your hate mail. Send those boy bunnies hate, off. I hate your stupid nasally voice. Stop interrupting the host to go at the real Glenn Close on twitter.com. This directed that if there was significant doubt, or, or the Obama had another executive order, 13526. That was uh, still during in 2009, during the first year of his presidency, and it replaced both of the preceding. Gets a little hairy here, but just remember, there's a Clinton one and a Bush one, and that'll, and then the first Obama one and the second one. If there's significant doubt about the appropriate level of classification, it shall be classified at the lower level, and stated, no information may remain classified indefinitely. That I is weird because indefinitely doesn't mean forever. It just means that there's no set expiration date so i don't know about that an original classification authority may extend the duration of classification up to 25 years from the date of origin of the document change the level of classification or reclassify specific information reduction of overclassification act is another obama era bill um if you read our article on september 11th you will see that the short version of my belief about what happened on 9-11 was that the American intelligence community became complacent and got caught with their pants down. And this is, um, you know, an attempt to, to address that because they, the thinking anyway, is that there was lots of overclassification of things, which made it impossible for agencies to share information. I, they're not sharing any information any more than they have, than they're getting their arm twisted into doing because these, Alphabet agencies are also a bit like college fraternities, and in many cases, you can track membership from college fraternities to 
these organizations. So they're not share. They're still not sharing any more information than they have to. But this is an attempt, anyway, to facilitate the sharing of information between agencies. Obama also gave us the FOIA Improvement Act of 2016, which had a whole slew of changes, which were again attempted to, you know, and and kind of end shenanigans that they i mean this is i think this is maybe part of the story too is that no matter what they pass they're always able to come up with some kind of shenanigans to um you know get around it and that's getting back to this price of liberty is eternal vigilance so everybody is wondering now how do i foia myself i i bet that that is the $64,000 question on uh, many of our listeners minds right now so how do you do that well you, there's forms to fill out i'm not going to walk you through that but there's some things to r- remember before you do it um, agencies continue to expand their websites with frequently requested data so if the information that you're looking for is been requested a thousand times already it's probably already online on the website final court opinions unpublished policy statements and staff manuals are always available FOIA does not apply to the president. Big shock. Congress, members of Congress, federal courts, judiciary, state and local governments, or private uh, individuals or organizations. So you can't FOIA a lot of stuff about a lot of people. Many agencies have electronic records. You may be able to download those. If the charts are tables, you can get an Excel file a lot of times, and you can look at those via email without – you request them via email without submitting a formal FOIA request. Simpler specific uh, records requests are processed more quickly than large complex ones, so breaking yours up into a bunch of little ones may be the way to go. You have to identify exactly which records you want and the agencies that have them. You can't just, um, you know, you can't just send send them, you know, tell me everything about uh, Operation Northwoods. They're not not probably going to respond to that. They won't acquire records from private sources for you either, so good luck getting those. And if you apply for the apply to the wrong agency, they will forward your request, but the de- delay will uh, take 10 days, maybe more. Fees are quite likely going to be associated. They're not going to do this for you for free. And there are no fixed response times. There are nine FOIA exemptions and three FOIA exclusions. Classified due to national security is the exemption, number one, and sometimes they can't even tell you that the document exists. This is why the NSA was known for the longest time as no such agency, because they did not even... They, when did they admit that the Delta Force existed? It was not that long ago. Um, boy, you beat me. I don't know. But yeah, for most of our lives, they denied the existence of the Delta Force, even though there was a Chuck Norris movie about it. I mean, everybody knew this thing existed. If it's related solely to internal personnel rules and practices, that's exempt. Uh, If it's exempt or prohibited under other laws, that seems pretty self-explanatory. Confidential or privileged business information, like trade secrets, they're not going to give you that. Communication within or between agencies, such as attorney-client, attorney work, or deliberative process privileges, things that are matters of personal privacy. This is why they redact the names of individuals. If it's compiled for law enforcement purposes, there you're not going to get it. If it's about supervision of financial institutions, you're not going to get it. Boy, I wonder how that carve out got written in there. Uh, <laughs> geological information on wells is God help us if North Korea ever gets their hands on that. Yeah, that's like that's kind of the most. I think they got the solidest case on that one. That. No one should, there's, people shouldn't know too much about the wells because that's a absolute disaster waiting to happen. Records are excluded if they're released to compromise an active investigation or prematurely reveal the identity of a conf, confidential source. And law enforcement records are considered particularly sensitive. Good luck getting those. And the uh, classified FBI records associated with foreign intelligence, counterintelligence, or international terrorism. Like, that's the one that, that's the kind of the one that I keep talking about. Like, I don't really want some dude who's making sure that a suitcase bomb doesn't go off in Chicago 
I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty content to not know what he's doing. And I yeah, think that I mean I assume he's 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 working on suitcase bombs, but he's probably got a stressful enough job without us poking into his business. You know, I, intelligence work is so unsexy now. It's mostly reading newspapers. It's really boring. You have no idea how boring CIA agent work is. It's, it's not, not like a Joe Don Baker movie. It no, they're not the. It's not the born identity. Oh, I was thinking more like Mitchell, but yeah, he was nah, a nah, cop. Nah. He was just a fat cop. I like the one where he goes to Malta. What's but the I'm one? digressing. Yeah, uh, that's just Mitchell the one called all day, Mitchell. Man. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't go to Malta and Mitchell. He so does go to Malta. What? No, he Mitchell. doesn't. Hold on, Mitchell <laughs> movie, 1975. We're so glad Which we have an editor. It was the coolest year because it's when Mitchell came out. No, <laughs> editor, leave this in. Okay, he did not go to Malta in that movie. Leave me alone. I'm going to say I have I have seen Mitchell maybe 20 times. Okay. I, I'm thinking I used of to, a different... I used to watch a lot of Mitchell uh, <laughs> when I got my first real apartment. I'm Mitchell, thinking of something else. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the... Every agency has its own policies, procedures, and fees, and that process is going to seem daunting, but there's little technicalities, but the broad strokes are the same throughout. So once you know these six things, it's really just a question of adding the specific details in. Uh, First of all, you have a right to request the records for any reason. Um, I don't know if you can request for no reason. That's interesting, and I would love to know if it's any reason or no reason, because that is important. So, but you know, you guys are smart. You can uh, you can come up with a reason. Every agency has to have a FOIA office and regulations that govern it, and the fee schedules and the waiver criteria and administrative appeal procedures, etc. You should receive an acknowledgement of your request that indicates whether the records were located, and if they are not enclosed. The acknowledgement needs to specify how and when you will receive them, listing the fees and explanations for any denials of your request. Your request can be expedited if you, la- uh, if the lack of expedited handling could jeopardize someone's safety or deprive someone of due process rights. That's more for lawyers than anything, lawyers and cops. If your request is denied, you have the right to appeal the decision in accordance with the agency's pol- policy and procedures. And the Office of Government Information Services has mediation services that FOIA requesters can use to resolve disputes with agencies without resorting to litigation. FOIA is definitely a lot more robust than it used to be. I think that we, again, need to remember that it's, it's up to you, people. The government is not going to do this because they're a bunch of good guys who have your best interests at heart. Uh, they're going to do it because you hound them. So if that's what you want to do, you know, go ham if you're going to do it. There's thousands of records entered into electronic databases every day that you can find online on these websites, electronic reading rooms. And as kind of comparatively weak as this thing is compared to how it could be or should be or however you want to put it, this is there's there's never been a better time to be a nosy american citizen and for that we are thankful so you know there's the other the other thing is that there's there's you know more and more people asking for it so it may take a bit longer than it used to but you should if you have you know the slightest interest in this you should definitely pursue it and just kind of see where it takes you and i would like to take you to ammo.com forward slash podcast where you can get twenty dollars off any order of two hundred dollars or more you know if we don't have it today check back tomorrow next day next week things like that you will be able to find probably what you're looking for if you just check you know don't sit there refreshing the page every three seconds or anything like that but check back in a couple of days that 223 that we were out of or we only had boxes of 20 of uh we could well have a box of a thousand by the time you check back so ammo.com forward slash podcast they're the sponsor of the show the resistance library i am sam jacobs for dave trello we will see you next time